Hey everyone, welcome to Provenet's monthly webinar on technology topics that are trending. Today we're talking about a really awesome topic. We're talking about low voltage technologies and specifically how organizations can utilize uh, low voltage technologies to work in conjunction with each other and how important it is to have a good low voltage strategy. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and uh, we hope you really enjoy today's session. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on low voltage technologies. My name is Frank Mazuka, and I am the marketing specialist here at Provenet Solutions. I'm going to introduce you to our two presenters today, as well as give you a brief background on Provenet Solutions. Our first presenter is Joe Velderman. Joe serves as Provenet's Director of Consulting Services. He works on site with clients and well represents the personal approach that Provenet takes with empowering all of our customers. Joe also provides leadership for Provenet's vision and leads all aspects of Provenet's managed services and long-term care strategies. Brett Keller is our networking and communications lead. He oversees all operations for daily break fix tickets and projects, whether they're large or small. He's responsible for the design and implementation of large-scale nurse call and wander guard systems. He works side-by-side -side with the client care team to design and advise on the sales of networked communication systems. If your company wants to be free to focus on your mission and core services, let Provenet provide the resources and services you need to succeed. Whether it's a single project or full-time on-site work, we partner with you to assess your needs and deliver a customized solution. Provenet's tight-knit group of experienced industry certified personnel are focused on customer satisfaction. We are a reputable and highly successful organization, fulfilling immediate IT needs and helping plan for those of tomorrow. We are always ready to put our extensive knowledge to work for you by developing strategies and solving challenges with the latest technology. Please feel free to ask us any questions today by typing in your question in the chat box below. Joe and Brett will get to them as soon as the webinar is over. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the webinar. Well, hey again, everyone. We're so grateful that you chose to join us today. Uh, I think we've got a really good technology topic that we're talking about this month. Uh, we're talking about low voltage technologies. And for those of you who may not know, low voltage technologies are things like Wi-Fi systems and uh, networks, local area networks, uh, phone systems, Wi-Fi networks, uh, nurse call systems, wander management systems, uh, and even structured cabling within a community. Uh, so that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about how important it is for those systems uh, to really methodically be thought out and uh, implemented in such a way that they can work to complement one, one another and work in conjunction with one another. There's a lot of power to be had if your low voltage systems are really working in conjunction with one another uh, and, and, and it creates just a really sound platform uh, for all the end users who rely on those systems on a day-to-day -day basis. So a couple strategies or a couple objectives for our uh, our, our webinar today. Uh, we want to talk about a few different systems. We're going to talk about uh, how to use life safety systems and wonder management systems. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about ways that organizations can use those technologies to really create a much safer environment for the residents. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, utilizing life safety systems even in an office setting. Uh, believe it or not, these systems have purposes outside of senior living and uh, post-acute care. And uh, we've seen these st uh, systems start to be implemented in places like schools and uh, government organizations. So we're going to be talking about that just a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, distributed antenna systems and how important that is. Uh, having the ability to replicate a signal from like a Verizon or a Sprint or a T-Mobile uh, or an AT&T to make sure that you've got really good cellular coverage within a building. Uh, we're going to talk about modern telephone systems and kind of the difference, the pros and cons between uh, hosted PBX uh, and a cloud uh, uh, or on-premise uh, PBX system. Uh, we're going to talk about how important structured cabling is and uh, uh, ways that you can efficiently implement those systems, kind of what the implication of some of the modern structured cabling uh, formats are. And we're going to talk about how to integrate these technologies together uh, to really uh, form a cohesive low voltage platform. So we're so grateful to have our uh, esteemed expert here from Provenet, Brett Keller. Thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here, Joe. Yeah, and uh, we're so grateful that you're willing to uh, 
lend your skills and your talents to the audience that's watching us today. So uh, thanks very much. We're looking forward to a great webinar. Definitely. Again, some topics we want to cover today. We want to talk about life safety systems, uh, uh, which particularly um, relate to both wander management and uh, nurse call. We want to talk about phone systems. We want to talk about Wi-Fi. So important today. It's like a uh, something that's as important as uh, bread or water, right? <laughs> Having good Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, we're going to talk about GPON networks. And for those of you who don't know what GPON stands for, it's Gigabit Passive Optical Networks and how uh, really important those are in a setting uh, that may have a lot of uh, buildings that need to be connected to one another. Uh, we're going to talk about structured cabling and we're going to talk about that distributed antenna system. So let's dive right in. You ready, Brett? Let's do it. All right. Uh, let's talk about wander management systems first, Brett. Tell, tell us about uh, modern wander management systems and why it's so important for uh, senior living, post-acute care organizations to have a really robust wander management system. Let's get right into it. So wander management is a system you use essentially to watch a resident's movements and that sounds a little big brotherish, but it's really about safety. Mm -hmm. So you want to know when a resident approaches a door that leaves the building. Mm -hmm. You need to know when a resident is leaving an area that is secured and you know it's safe for those residents. Right. This is a system that basically gives you the ability to know when a resident is in a certain area, when they go through a certain door. You can use uh, several kinds of equipment to do this, but really, in the end, it's just about safety and making sure your residents don't get into trouble and you know where they're at and you can protect them sufficiently. So you brought up a really great point on wander management. It kind of sounds a little bit Big Brother-ish, right? It does. And uh, <laughs> nobody wants to be monitored without their consent or their, their willingness to be monitored. But what types of residents typically uh, utilize a wander management system? I think about residents that maybe have uh, uh, some some cognitive issues, uh, maybe struggling with some dementia, potentially even Alzheimer's, um, who may you know just kind of be disoriented from time to time, or uh, be thinking about you know doing something that they're passionate about outside of the facility, which causes a big risk, right? Is that yes. typically where we see very, wander very management common. systems? So yes, you're looking for your memory care residents. So this is mostly used. Uh, you brought, you brought up the topic, you have uh, Alzheimer's or early onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. These residents, they need assistance. You know, yeah. they may believe that their wherewithal is fine and they know that they can go do this. And in their head, they're thinking, I'm safe to do this. But our responsibility or your responsibility is going to be to make sure that you know what they can safely do. Right. And this is just simply a way to do that and using technology that basically, you know, like I said, it guards these doors. Um, you're just protecting the residents who need protection. So right. it's, it's, it, it sounds big brotherish, but it really is about, you know, like you mentioned, cognitive ability. Where is a resident? And you're going to monitor this. Right. Your job is going to be to know when a resident is AL or a resident is transitioning to a point where they might need to go skill. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, you can use these tools or this technology to give yourself the advantage already and you can protect them before you're even maybe a hundred percent sure you know something's going to go wrong that's and that's right. the key that's right that's right how do wander management systems work what are the devices what are the components that make up a wander management system and how, how would a resident trigger an alert uh, as a wander threat so the key components would be you're going to set up doors with things that are basically sort of an access control function but essentially these are specific devices for wander management that go above a door and then the resident that you're protecting will have a tag on them. So typically called a wander tag. This is basically a small little device that they have on them. They can be put with a safety band or a secure band and this makes sure that they can't remove this if they don't, they don't know why it's there. Well, you sometimes have to make sure they don't want to remove it even if they want to and they can't. So. Doing that, you use that device, and this device, this tag, if you will, will tell that system, okay, this door right here knows it's looking for tags. Mm -hmm. That tag gets in the field, it's called. When that tag is in field, that system will give you a pre-alert. Okay. That pre-alert is kind of, um, it's, it's a local beep at the door. Okay. So it tells you someone might be in the vicinity where you need to be aware, aware of where they are. 
but it's not going to send an alarm or trigger an event that everyone is aware of quite yet. Mm -hmm. Then once that door is opened, so a, a device on top of the door and a device on the door itself, a door contact is used, and that says, oh, well this door is now open and there's a resident with a tag in the field. Ah. Putting those together, you now have a system that says we have an, an emergency system, um, we have an emergency where this resident is walking out, we need to immediately send staff to make sure we secure them and they're safe. Yep. So that's essentially the pieces that work together. And let's tie that in a little bit and talk about your cabling. You mentioned structured cabling. Right. Structured cabling is a way so that you can get different doors in different areas of the building or even different buildings to be connected to each other so this wander management is seamless throughout everywhere in your campus and the residents are safe anywhere they are. That's great, that's great. So essentially you create like a little geofence almost a uh, around a door and if the door is open or if the egress uh, is, is activated uh, and if there's a wander uh, threat that's within that geofence then the caregiver will get an alert to say Hey, there might be a threat here. Is that right? That's a good point. So yes, you're you're tailoring this system so that you don't want to know where a resident is all day long. That would be big brother. We don't need to know that. Right. We need to know when a resident is approaching something unsafe. Right. So that's where you're creating that small area that basically is protected. And when the resident is in that area, you have your system and it's active and it takes care of alerting. Uh, another thing to keep in mind there is that can be changed as well as to where if you're going to say let's say a resident approaches that well if someone is outside of the door and they need to come in but they don't know that residents inside the door mm -hmm. that's what a lot of and you're, you'd be surprised a lot of memory care residents are waiting by the door looking for that opportunity if you will yeah well someone staff wise or otherwise comes in that door from outside doesn't realize that person was waiting and they sneak out that door well, now it doesn't matter who opens the door from inside, outside, or whatever. Mm -hmm. As long as that door is open, you mm -hmm. now have a system of alerting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really great, really great. So, um, do you see wonder management systems deployed outside of uh, a door system? Or like, could you just put it as a, a system within a hallway, for example? That's a great point. So, you have doors that are protected with one type of system. Yeah. You have uh, hallways can be done with a door system, but it simply would not use a door contact. So okay. anytime you have a transition, if you have a vestibule, if you have any kind of area where you just have a doorway that's open all the time, basically you can create the same system with a bubble, if you will, and that bubble protects that whole area so no one can pass through the area. Okay. Whether the door is open or there is no door, you're still creating that safety guard. Right. Well, uh, kind of related uh, to uh, wander management, still talking along the lines of life safety systems, uh, tell us a little bit about modern nurse call systems and what kind of trends we're seeing with regards to uh, this particular component uh, of a life safety system. So a nurse call system is a use for a life safety alerting system for a CCRC or a skilled building or any kind of building to basically say, how do I alert someone in that situation? And this is where you're tying into your wander guard. And you brought up in the beginning, we want to use all our systems. We want to implement systems that work together, right? Mm -hmm. So our nurse call is basically going to act as our alerting system for our wander management system. Yep, which so, is so important because we don't want caregivers carrying around a cell phone for one system and a pager for another mm -hmm. system and looking at lights in the ceiling for another system, right? We want a unified alerting platform, which is just really huge for the caregivers to just have one means of receiving alerts, right? Definitely, yeah. You're going to make it as simple as possible. Don't have them, you know, overburdened with mm -hmm. gear and give them the device they know is very important to have with them at all times because it's resident care. Right, right. Uh, so, that, yeah, basically our nurse call systems are alerting. Okay. Um, life safety or the systems that provide nurse call are made up of a couple of different systems, but basically you want to use this equipment to send out, you brought up, you know, pages, telephone calls, you can do all kinds of different alerting emails, 
um, turn on video cameras, whatever is needed, mm -hmm. this system is basically your brain that tells the, um, there's different servers, there's different components, but it tells the system, hey, we have something that needs to be, you need to be aware of, right? Right. So, or might right. need a response. Right, right. So, right. So what kind of um, alerts trigger a nurse call system? Uh, when Obviously, you know, if a resident or, or uh, someone in the community is having some sort of a challenge, they trigger the alert. What kind of challenges might those be for a particular resident? So that's going to vary all over the place, but the easiest way I think about it would be devices. Mm -hmm. yeah, so good. let's look at it this way. If you have a resident's room you want to protect, yep. you want to give them the ability to call a nurse, let's mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Well, essentially you're going to put a pull cord in that room, which gives them easy access, and you put these in bathrooms, and you can put these in living rooms and kitchens, but we have even better stuff for that now. Ah. But basically your bathrooms and maybe a living room can be protected with a pull cord that they pull. Immediately that sends a message to the system and then the system determines or you determine what that system is going to send what kind of alert. Okay. So okay. you have so, situ... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, well, that's okay. What, what, what are the better systems that we might put in a living room or a kitchen or something like that? So this is the fun stuff. So that's called mobile duress. Okay. These are... They're not new, they've been around for a while, but they're getting better and better every day. One of the most common ones we see are pendants. So pendants are essentially small devices that are maybe about an inch in size by about a half inch thick, and it's got one button on it. And simply they press this button no matter where they're at, if they're in their living room, they're in their bedroom, they're outside of their room in the hallway, they're eating dinner, wherever they're at, they have the ability to press that button and the system will basically say, oh, I got an alert. But on top of that, the system also uses what's called points of interest or what's essentially a sort of GPS-like inside of a building. Really? So you plot these points, you tell the system, now I know if anything presses near this area, this is approximately where they're at. And when they press their pendant, boom, you've got a location. Yeah. That's huge because now you not, not only know who it was, but you know where they need help if they're not just sitting in their room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that sounds really evolutionary. Uh, when I think about nurse call systems, I typically think about the old, you know, pull cord system mm -hmm. that you mentioned, or uh, maybe in a skilled nursing setting, uh, a, a button uh, in the bed or a cord in the bed mm -hmm. where you know I'm pressing for help and I'm calling uh, one of my nurses to come and help me with that. But you're talking about technology that allows uh, for really a lot of freedom. Um, and is really kind of almost more of a personal emergency response system where a resident has the ability to roam a community uh, and still, you know, be tracked or s still have the ability to be found uh, mm -hmm. if they're outside of their room, right. uh, regardless of their location, which is great because uh, we know from experience that residents don't always uh, stay in their room 100% <laughs> of the time, right? That's kind of the whole point behind a life plan community yes. or a uh, uh, a continuing care retirement community where residents have the ability to be very social and they have the ability to go uh, to the fitness center or to the pool or to another resident's room to play a game of peanut mm -hmm. or to a lounge to watch a movie or something like that and so you know we still want to be able to give them the ability to uh, solicit help if they need help uh, and make that super easy for them so uh, it's great to hear that te technology continues to advance Definitely. It's all about safety, ease of use, and like you said, giving the residents the best way to solicit help. You know, you want to make that simple because even if this resident is an AL resident or even IL residents, they still might fall, there still might be a situation where they need help, and you want it to be as easy as possible and as quick as possible for them to get someone there. Yeah, yeah. So what kind of infrastructure do we put in the community to uh, receive these alerts? So I'm, you know, walking around with my uh, duress pendant on, or I've got my pull cord in the room, or uh, maybe a, a series of different other devices that can initiate an alert. What kind of infrastructure goes, you know, behind the wall and in the ceilings to, to make these systems talk to some sort of an alerting platform? Well, so we've got to look at this in two ways. We've got nurse call systems that are wired and nurse call systems that are wireless. Oh. Believe it or not, the old wireless wired systems are still in existence all over the place. Mm -hmm. 
There's reasons for that. Okay. The main reason would be code. Okay. A lot of states or even local municipalities will require if you're this type of building, say you're skilled or say you're AL, uh, they're going to ask that you have a wired system in place. Mm. So it may not be the newest technology, but they still believe it's the most reliable. And that's the key is that certain states or areas want that reliability and they're not quite sold on wireless yet. Really? So have, have we found in our experience that a wireless platform is not as uh, robust as a wired platform? Great point. We have not. Okay. So we use wireless almost every time nowadays. The only time we use wired is when we have to for code. Yeah. So I don't think we've seen any degradation of the system's capabilities or reliability or anything with wireless. And obviously your, your installation implementation cost for a wireless system uh, would have to be significantly less than you know running cable all over the place right that's your huge savings point right there is basically structured cabling right right well you have to create a network of wires for every single device and if you have wired systems you don't have that mobile duress because you don't have the wireless function there mm -hmm. whereas like you said you just right. implement right so let's talk about what we do so we have a couple of pieces here. We have a server, which is your head-end equipment or your brains of the operation. Mm -hmm. So that server is basically going to create or have a system that creates the alerts when it receives messages. Mm -hmm. Well, how does it receive the messages? You're going to create a wireless network, and this isn't what you put your laptop on. I was just going to ask that question. We're not talking about like Wi-Fi networks, right? right? Uh, not the same kind of wireless that I would connect uh, my laptop or my phone or my tablet to. This is a totally different kind of wireless. Maybe take a second sure. and talk about that kind of wireless for a second. So wireless or Wi-Fi is amazing. We love it. We love to be on our laptops and our phones everywhere. Right. But what we don't want is a lot of people on their laptops or their phones or different devices on the network we are using for the safety of our residents. Mm -hmm. So in that, you use a proprietary wireless network that's on a different band or a different wireless network mm -hmm. signal, mm -hmm. and essentially you tailor that network for just the nurse call system. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's um, the key there is that you don't have any interference from too many devices or other devices. You don't have any chance that their security or anything else can affect performance of this because this needs to be a, I don't want to say one trick pony because it definitely has capabilities to do a lot of things, but you want this locked down. Yep. You want this very proprietary just for your nurse call system. Right. right. So I know uh, nurse call systems really uh, elemental in uh, skilled nursing settings and personal emergency response systems, just a really, really great uh, service offering for residents who might be part of a community in, in an assisted living setting or an independent living setting. Uh, where are we seeing these types of systems being installed outside of senior living and uh, post-acute care? This is one of my favorite topics. This is really cool because when you think of nurse call, you think of a system that's used what? To call a nurse. Mm -hmm. You think of a hospital, right? You think of you're on a bed and you press a button and a nurse comes in. You think of a care situation where you have residents who need your protection or need help in an emergency. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think outside of the box, that system essentially is just a system that's used for alerting or awareness. Mm -hmm. Well, that's needed all over the place nowadays, is it not? Yeah. So Unfortunately, the world that we live in requires that. Yes. There's definitely um, a broadening horizon of what these systems can do and what people are using them for. So when you ask where, I would say your biggest is going to be a school. Uh, I don't even like to talk about it, but you do unfortunately have active shooter situations. You have uh, student problems where a teacher is in danger. You have a system where you just want to alert someone. There's a teacher who had an accident or fell or needs help for whatever reason or a student. Mm -hmm. Well, if you employ the same technology and you create that brain of the system with the devices that are in the rooms or the teachers carry, you're giving yourself a protection for your staff and a peace of mind that goes way beyond just the nurse call aspect. Yeah. Uh, if we want to talk about not just schools, let's look at offices, right? 
your staff in your office also might need protection. Let's say there's another situation where something goes wrong outside of a building mm -hmm. and you want everyone to know. Mm -hmm. Well, these systems are actually capable of doing mass alerting. Um, even on a small scale, they do mass alerting as well, but just a small scale where you say you have 100 employees and you need to let them all know don't leave the building, we have an emergency situation, something happened. Mm -hmm. Well, you can let everybody know via an instant message through the system, which can go to their texts, it can go to their phones, it can make calls, it can send emails. So it saves, really? wow. kind of it's a platform. Think of it, you know, if you need to let someone know something's going on or someone needs to let you know something's going on, right. that system is there for you, whether you're in an office, school, right. or continued care. Yeah, I've actually seen these systems, uh, personal emergency response system, be installed in a government setting. Uh, I know of uh, at least one uh, municipality that gave all of their council members uh, uh, a pendant, essentially, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, as they were uh, coming into the chambers or leaving the chambers or going out to the parking lot or whatever, uh, they had the ability to carry that pendant with them and mm -hmm. uh, get assistance if they needed it uh, as a council member. So uh, again, just a really unique uh, but effective use of that uh, wireless technology. Oh yeah, there's so many uses. Even if we go beyond the office, you go into your government employees, well, there's even newer technology that they've come up with for what would be a nurse call system or essentially an alerting system for humidity and temperature sensors. Wow. So we've seen this deployed in a situation where, let's say you're a food company who has freezers all over the place storing your food, or you are, of course, required by code to make sure these freezers stay a certain temperature. Mm -hmm. Well, you can use this system along with temperature and humidity systems uh, or sensors, and you can even use water bugs, which is a common device that's used to detect if there's water. Mm -hmm. So you can actually protect your investment in your building as far as making sure your food stays up to quality, everything is where it should be. There's just, no, it probably won't end. There's gonna be new everyday devices and new things you can think of to use an alerting system. For. Yeah, so. yeah, cool. Cool. It's great to see that that technology is continuing to evolve and continuing to uh, find new ways to uh, uh, monitor scenarios, monitor environments, and be able to provide effective alerting of that. Uh, well, I think you wanted to kind of share a little bit on the types of alerts that people might receive, and this is probably a pretty quick topic, but uh, important to talk about uh, because uh, a lot of individuals like to receive different types of alerts. Uh, some individuals may have requirements to receive alerts uh, even outside of uh, the, the network or outside of the office uh, at home or uh, you know on the road or something like that. What kind of alerts can we configure this type of a system to send to us? Good topic, good topic. So yes, we want to, there's a couple of theories on this, but the main idea is pagers. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a nurse call situation, a lot of people like pagers, which uh, that would consist of the nurse call system what's called a paging base, and that sends a local signal to the pagers. Mm -hmm. Once again, this is a signal that's only used by these pagers by this system. Mm -hmm. That creates your reliability, that creates your uh, situation where you're not gonna find interference or have other systems interfere with that signal. Okay. That is probably one of the largest alerting uh, systems or types of alerting devices you're going to see. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the same old pager from the 90s that you know people carried. It's pretty funny to see, but it's very effective. What about response times too? I know that's so important, uh, especially in, in skilled nursing. Um, you know, acknowledging alert is, is one thing, but being able to respond to that in a really timely fashion, that's another thing. What, what happens if an alert goes you know, unacknowledged or unresponded to for, say, five or ten minutes or something like that? Is there, is there a way to escalate that to a, another level or to the fire department or something like that? Definitely. Um, so those nurse call systems also have the ability to integrate to different systems. Wander management's one of them. Well, you can also integrate to a fire panel. Mm. So fire panels have their own proprietary devices and systems to alert the fire department immediately of an emergency, and you can kind of tailor your nurse call system to alert that fire panel, and in certain situations, say there's an actual fire, a smoke detector has gone to the point where it's in alarm, 
that's immediately going to let everyone know through your local alerting or your text messaging as well as your fire panel which can then determine if it needs to escalate to the fire department. Wow. Um, on top of that you have basically you have uh, tiered escalations. So that's what you touched on escalations and that's huge. What you don't want to do is tell everybody in the building about every little thing that happens every time, right? We'd be getting text messages every 30 yes. seconds, right? <laughs> so you've got, let's say, 200 residents in a situation, in a community. Well, you're going to have a relatively large amount of calls over that day. And you talked about that's basically alert fatigue, right? right. We don't want everyone to the point where their phone or their text messages or their pager goes off so much. They can't even think anymore. They can't do their job outside of that. Right. So essentially we use what's an escalated alert system. We say, hey, the first alert came in. It's this type of alert. And you can tailor this to a pendant, to a pull cord, to a fire system, whatever kind of alerting it is. And even a wander management system. Because in a wander situation, we probably want to let everyone know. Because mm -hmm. this could be a real emergency very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... You essentially can have, hey, I'm going to let, you know, all my staff know except for the management and uh, some executives. Then you can tier that, so say tier two, well now we include all the managers and the executives. Mm -hmm. And then at that point you can repeat that alert and say now we're going to just keep telling everybody in a deter predetermined uh, time period, every two minutes let's say we're going to keep telling them, hey, we still have this, you have not cleared this situation. Wow. So it's, it's very really going to nag you until you yes. take care of that <laughs> alert, right? But at the same time it's nagging you, it's also giving you the ability to say, okay, someone pressed, pulled their pull cord, we need to check them, but we don't need to tell people in the AL building that somebody pulled their pull cord in an IL building, right? Yeah, right. So right. you can tailor all these alerts to different areas and then how often they go and who gets the alert each time. Highly configurable, highly configurable. Yes. Great, great. Well, I want to keep moving because uh, we've got a limited amount of time here. Um, let's talk about uh, phone systems and unified communications a little bit. Um, gosh, there's so many vendors out there uh, or providers out there who uh, you know manufacture different types of phone systems. How do we make heads or tails of what's important and what's not in a phone system? I know you know there's a lot of uh, I see commercials on TV for cloud-based phone systems now. Um, and, and I'm sure that there's advantages to that, uh, but you know, what, what, what are we seeing in phone systems today? So, think back in the day you had a phone system, and what did you have? You had a jack on the wall with sometimes 50 wires going to this single jack, <laughs> and essentially they all fed to your telecom or your data room, and then there you had a system that was local to you that you managed, you purchased, and you maintained. So. Essentially, that was phone systems for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Now, they got to the point where you might only have two wires now for your phone, but there's still a wired connection there, and you still manage that, and you still maintain it. What we're doing now, and we're seeing now, is these hosted voice solutions. Excellent systems for, let's say you have two offices. Well, you need Office A to be able to talk to Office B, but you don't want to buy a phone system and put another phone system in the other office. Or maybe you do, there's nothing wrong with that. We see a lot of use in both types. Yep. But essentially what you have are these hosted or internet-based, cloud-based solutions. So you buy phones or you lease phones, and these phones essentially communicate to a hosted system that someone else has off-site. And that gives you the ability to not have all the equipment and be burdened by all the maintenance and everything else. You simply have what you need, which would be your phones and an internet connection. Mm -hmm. So the hosted system, what kind of connectivity does that re rely on? Is that still, uh, you know, POTS lines or PRIs, or is that uh, really dependent upon an internet connection? So that's definitely a good point. You have to have an internet connection to use a hosted system. You don't have an internet service provider or a service provider giving you your phone lines anymore. Your hosted system also provides your phone system as well as your lines, whether it be a PRI or whatever kind of lines you're using. They provide all of that, but you do have to have an internet connection. You do have to have a reliable and fairly decent speed internet connection. Sure. At the same time, 
you're going to have um, a VoIP system or an Ethernet jack system in your office. Mm -hmm. So if you have phone jacks, essentially you can't just plug your phone into a phone jack if it's an Ethernet based phone, which is called VoIP. You're plugging your phone into the internet, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I know it's a really big topic, we don't have to get into it too deep, but uh, what are some of the advancements that we're seeing uh, at Provenet with regards to uh, unified communications? Another good topic. So when we talk about phone systems, we talk about your old school phone system. You picked it up, you made a phone call, you hung up. So you had a dial tone, you made a phone call. Well, today's systems using these unified communications platforms give you the ability to do a lot more. Yep. So you can use your email, believe it or not, to set a meeting. And in that meeting, you can say, okay, we need to have a conference call. You can book the room. You can tell your system, hey, I need to uh, have a conference bridge, conference bridge opened up at this time. You can send out everybody to let them know they need this. Uh, another great system would be your ability to monitor your phone traffic and all that through these communication systems. So even instant messaging can now be done through a unified communication system. Wow. So it really ties all your office's operations into one neat, tidy little package. Yeah. I know one of the abilities that I appreciate most about our phone system at Provenet is this ability to uh, uh, always be able to ring my phone regardless mm -hmm. of where I'm at. I think you guys call it find me, follow me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, I don't spend a ton of time in the office. I, I typically uh, am out traveling, uh, working with customers or um, you know, working at, at, a, at a conference or an event or something like that, occasionally playing a charity golf outing. <laughs> uh, and I still want to be able to be reached by you know anyone who wants to contact me. I always have my mobile phone with me, so I can instruct our phone system to say, hey, I'm going to be out of the office, forward all my calls to my uh, mobile phone. And that way, uh, there's no difference really to the end user. Uh, who's trying to reach me, uh, but I receive all my phone calls on my mobile phone at that point. Definitely, that's your unified communications in action. So I don't want to just have a phone system anymore. I want to say, I'm out of the office. Well, I set myself as out of the office, or I set myself to say, I'm going to be gone at this time for this meeting. I want to forward my phone to my cell phone, all in one, easy done. Yep, yep. Cool, cool. I know that that's... Uh, been something that I've taken advantage of uh, even at Provenet. So it's really neat to, again, see the evolution of this technology uh, really start to benefit the users quite a bit. Very neat stuff. Let's talk about structured cabling. Uh, this may not be a term that our audience is particularly familiar with, but um, uh, you know, what is structured cabling? So when you think of cabling, you think of, I've got a jack in the wall, it goes somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, your structured cabling is basically, it's a larger overview of all your cabling in the building, how you have network closets, you have devices, you have um, different types of cabling that go from point A to point B, you have cabling that works with wired systems or wireless systems, because believe it or not, wireless still requires cabling. Mm -hmm. So your structured cabling is essentially the idea that you have a purpose here and you create a very manageable and detailed structure that says, I have cables in rooms A, B, and C. They feed to every room in the building. You know what cable goes to what room. So if there's anything you need to change, it's easy to manage. And then essentially, you're also considering uh, your long distance and structured, which would be where we get into those different cables, which I think we're gonna talk about in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, we, can, we can wait to kind of talk about that too, but, um, I know that there's different types of cables that have different attenuations. Uh, you know, we can use copper for a certain distance. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, we have to go to a different type of cable. We'll kind of get into that a little bit. A, a big question I do have is, you know, uh, w within a community, where does uh, structured cabling begin and the service provider end? That's a good topic, too. Boy, I like all your topics, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so, essentially, we want to know what's called a demarcation point. And that's basically where your service provider hands off your cabling and says, here's your signal, your internet, your phone, whatever, bit, whatever system that is, that's demarc or demarcation point. And from then on, you're going to go into what's probably an MDF or a main data closet that essentially says, 
This is where I was handed off my equipment. Now, structured cabling everywhere on out from here is mine. Okay. That's okay. your termination point. Great. Great. You know, we wanted to talk about different types of cabling. Uh, what, what types of cabling do we typically see in a, in, a, in a community? So, we've got a lot of copper systems, of course. Um, copper's great. It's got a good local solution. And you mentioned distance. Well, you want to keep 300 feet or less on your copper rods. So you might very well have, let's say, 100 feet in the hallway and offices on both ends. It's okay to use copper to get between those, but you are still limited to a certain speed with that copper, even though the distance is not your limitation. Mm -hmm. That's when we step up to fiber. Okay. So fiber is that optical or that glass, and essentially that's a high, high speed um, cable that gives you the ability to go long distances, there's single mode, there's multi-mode, and it gets a little technical, but the basis is you have a lot of capability with fiber to go as far as you need to go or to get as fast as you need to get between point A and B. So we've got, you know, like you said before, our MDF closet, which is sort of the central brains of our network. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, we might have other networking closets. I think you guys call them IDFs, yep. uh, located throughout the building. and. Uh, from the IDF, we'll have uh, copper cabling come in, but uh, connecting each IDF back to the MDF, we may use fiber for that, right? Definitely. There's a mixture. You might, uh, like I said, you're basing distance here. Well, even if it's uh, 100 feet apart, you should probably connect your switches or this core equipment that's used to provide data to everyone with fiber. So you want to do, it's standard today that you do fiber between all components and then fiber for your long distance or high speed areas. Yeah, and in 2017, what are we recommending for speed? Gigabit, 10 gigabit, So 40 gigabit? That kind of gets into a, a future proofing situation because we don't want to plan for 2017, right? We want to plan for 2023 because yeah. you never know what's going to happen. You're growing your business. Well, you don't want to become stagnant in your network that handles that traffic. Right. So. Right now, you want to plan for, I guess if I had to say at this point, we're probably looking for 10 gig. Mm -hmm. You might not be using 10 gig, so you need to think about when will I be using 10 gig? Because if you look, a few years ago, we weren't using one gig, and a few years before that, we weren't even using gigabit. <laughs> so it really gets, it's, the speed is increasing so rapidly, right. and there's kind of an unsaid rule that says every couple years, things are gonna change a lot. So essentially, you want to plan for years ahead now, which is where I would recommend your 10 gig, which is where you get into your fiber. Yep, yep. Uh, Wi-Fi is just sort of like one of these elemental things that we need to live, right? I think there's a commercial on TV that talk about like bread, water, and Wi-Fi. <laughs> and uh, we say that kind of tongue in cheek, but it, it really is important, especially in uh, senior living. Um, a lot of residents will say, you know, how good is the food at your community? And then follow that question up by, do you have Wi-Fi? <laughs> uh, so uh, again, uh, with Wi-Fi, it's so elemental. Um, uh, many residents are almost demanding this as they're looking at moving into a community. Tell us sort of uh, what to look for. What are the pros and cons of Wi-Fi? Uh, what, uh, what are the things that uh, uh, administrators should be looking at when they're looking at uh, deploying Wi-Fi within a community? So with Wi-Fi, what you're going to do is you're going to create pros. Obviously, you're going to give everybody connection all over the place. We don't want to have to plug into walls nowadays. Right. Residents want to plug in or re residents want their data everywhere. Your staff needs their data everywhere. Uh, even today, it's common that 80% of uh, communication done in a business is done on the move. It's in the building, but it's not at a desk. So essentially, we want to provide access points, if you will, which are going to be wireless terminals that are all throughout a building and create a bubble for everyone to have connectivity everywhere. Mm -hmm. The things you're looking for, of course, are uh, communication or a seamless transition from your wired to wireless. You're looking for security, right? A big topic today, as we just referred to, was you want to keep all your data secure. You've got PHI, you've got different kinds of data that you need to make sure. Well, Wireless gives you a lot of ability, just like a wired network, to kind of section off that data and say, okay, so-and-so can access wireless here, but they can only get to the internet. Mm -hmm. 
these people here can access the internet, but they even can't go everywhere on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, or there's also going to be, say, a corporate network, which is a wireless network that says, I need these people to access our DFS or our files that are online. Right. So we can use wireless because let's say, Joe, you're going from building A to building B, but you're trying to talk to someone about something and you need to look it up real quick or get a file. You don't want to have to wait till you're over there. Business is always moving, so you want to be able to do that on the go. Well, that's one of the big things is your security and your ease of access to different networks on the wireless. Uh, another thing. Let, let, let me pause real quick because I think a lot of um, cable TV providers, internet service providers, they're starting to uh, offer Wi-Fi. So as an organization, why wouldn't I want to go to somebody like a Comcast or Xfinity uh, or Verizon Fios or Time Warner or something like that and say, hey, I just want Wi-Fi everywhere in my community. Can you guys provide that for me? They're going to say yes every time. <laughs> right? But what's the advantage to a community providing uh, a unified wireless system um, or ubiquitous wireless system versus somebody like Comcast or, or Verizon providing Wi-Fi? What you're going to get from having your own wireless versus Comcast, one of the main things is going to be you're creating a ubiquitous network that essentially anybody can access anywhere in your building mm -hmm. and they're not going to have to go into their room and connect to Bob's Wi-Fi and then when they get somewhere else they got to go to Jen's Wi-Fi and they're everywhere all over the place with 25 different networks or 100 different networks. Mm -hmm. Well, by using your large network that you create throughout your building, you can give staff, residents, and every even guests access and protected, secured access to the system from anywhere in the building by logging on to one simple network. You create one big wireless bubble as opposed to 150 little micro bubbles throughout the building. Exactly. Right? Yeah, it's a great way to look at it, uh, and it's a great point to make, I think. Uh, there's a lot of appeal to working with somebody like a Verizon or a Comcast because they'll oftentimes, you know, give away those systems with a monthly service fee for each one. Um, and like you said, that monthly service fee adds up over time and there's a cost associated with that. But at the end of the day, many providers aren't going to be satisfied with 150 wireless networks being displayed. It's a nightmare to pull that up on your phone or your tablet and try to figure out which one to connect to. Uh, having a consistent wireless experience regardless of your location on a campus is really, really important. Yes, you definitely want that seamlessness, right? You want everybody all over to be able to go anywhere and communicate. Yep, yep. Well, let's uh, let's keep moving on here. I know uh, a, a cool topic that I'm excited to talk about uh, and something that we're really starting to see a lot more of in senior living uh, is, is GPON networks. <laughs> Um, and I'm sure that that's a term that not many people uh, have heard of before. Uh, as I mentioned before, GPON stands for Gigabit Passive Optical Network. And as I understand it, this is the same type of technology that uh, somebody like AT&T uses for their Uverse product or uh, something like Verizon you know, might use for their Fios product where they, they build a, a dedicated fiber optic network within a residential neighborhood uh, and connect each home or each building within that neighborhood uh, to the fiber optic network. Uh, but we can build this out as a private network as well, correct? Definitely, yes. So essentially a GPON is a network such as Fios and it's known as, another term would be fiber to the home mm -hmm. or fiber to the area. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're using fiber, that glass technology, and you're essentially creating your own private system where you can deploy data, you can deploy TV, you can provide all kinds of different phone service, whatever you need to, um, from building to building, from let's say you have cottages on a CCRC and you've got cottages out in the open, yep. and you've got 120 of them, you could provide everyone just like AT&T or Verizon does, but the biggest thing is you're controlling this data now, mm -hmm. and you're not paying a monthly service fee once again for every single resident who basically, if you're including this in your package or if you're just having them pay it, in the long term, you're gonna save a lot of money and you're gonna create security once again. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, another system. Um, that system, uh, also very important, uh, distributed antenna system. Uh, where are we seeing distributed antenna systems and why is, it, why is it important to implement something like that? So distributed antenna system is basically gonna be used anywhere from an office 
you're going to use it in a community where you're providing resident care essentially anywhere where you have someone with a mobile device that needs to be online and let's say they need to make a phone call and they're between two buildings well you basically could say in this area and let's say there's a pathway downstairs between the buildings or something like that in a basement a lot of times we don't get cell signal here the distributed antenna system is going to take that cell system <clears throat> cellular signal and distribute it throughout the building with a system of antennas. Yeah, and, and I know from experience I've seen this uh, be required uh, by at least one um, municipality for new construction uh, where the fire department depended on, I think it was Sprint, uh, they depended on Sprint uh, to be able to connect and, and so firefighters could talk to one another uh, using the Sprint network and uh, they required that a distributed antenna system be put into um, the community that was being constructed. Definitely, you know, cellular uh, communication isn't just for private use. It isn't just for certain uses anymore. Everyone needs it. And once again, you talked about how everything ties together. Mm -hmm. You want seamless communication. You want it from your mobile devices. You want it from your laptops. You want mm -hmm. it from residents on Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So the distributed antenna system is just another way to provide the cellular signal you need to keep your business going or protect your residents. Yep, yep. So again, we talked about all these systems and how uh, they've evolved and, and how they work independently, but uh, it, it really is just so important for uh, providers to have a dedicated low voltage strategy because so many of these systems uh, talk to one another and so many of these systems can leverage uh, each other's capabilities to really uh, become strong. One of the things that frustrates me as a technology consultant is going into a community and seeing uh, a waste of resources uh, where you've got an independent local area network for the computers uh, to connect all the computers together. And then you've got a separate local area independent network uh, to connect all of the phones together. And you've got maybe got a separate uh, network to connect uh, doors or, or video surveillance or something like that. And it, it, it's just an incredible waste of resources to me because those can all, it's all the same technology. Yes. Uh, it's all structured cable and switching and they can all, you know, leverage the same core common technology components. Uh, it's just a matter of making sure that uh, those systems are connected to one another and the traffic is segmented out. Talk about how all these systems come together in a cohesive way, Brett. Well, so we talked about uh, our structured cabling. I like to think of that as the backbone of my network. This is where your bulk of your data transmission will go. Even if it goes to wireless, it's starting with structured cabling. So you're gonna get a signal into your building from a provider. You're gonna distribute that signal throughout the building through the structured cabling. You're gonna use the Wi-Fi system to give yourself coverage in areas that you can't plug into. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have a nurse call system that relies on a wireless system of sorts that basically gets that alert or everybody um, connected so that you can protect your residents. <clears throat> You're gonna have a uh, wander management system that relies on that nurse call system that relies on that wireless <laughs> that relies on that structured cable, right? <laughs> so, so many dependencies there. Yes. I mean, you just said the word relies like four <laughs> or five times and I, I get it. I mean, it's it's there's so much dependency that, that these systems require. And that's kind of where you said you don't want to come in and say I need nurse call get nurse call in here, but don't think about the structured cabling, don't think about how the Wi-Fi ties in. Yep. You really want uh, even distributed antenna systems, all these things, you want to tie them together so that you use each one to leverage and make a better system overall, and you save money in the long run because you basically thought of this as one large system that can do anything however the data is transmitted. That's right, that's right. Well, Brett, uh, we talked about a lot of complex topics today, and I just so appreciate your expertise. You've made things very relatable, and uh, I, I feel like I understand things better after talking to you today. So uh, I want to thank you for being our panelist today and being our subject matter expert. Um, I'm sure that you may have some questions today, and we're going to field some of those questions. Brett's here to answer any questions that you may have, so uh, please feel free to submit those either through the GoToMeeting uh, text box uh, or um, via email. Uh, you're welcome to email info at for any questions that you might have. 
if you're going through an effort right now and you're talking about uh, some construction or some remodeling and you want to have some expert advice on uh, low voltage systems, we're here to help. Uh, like I said before, these are some pretty complex topics and uh, we want to make sure that uh, you're able to uh, leverage a lot of these systems to their fullest extent and uh, be able to leverage them in such a way that's very cohesive with one another. So we're here to answer any questions that you have, whether it's today or uh, ongoing. Feel free to contact us at any time. We've got the website up there, www.provinet.com. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and uh, we hope that you have a great day. Thanks so much.